So thank you all very much for joining us today for our webinar on COVID-19 and construction, early lessons for a new normal. In this presentation, Alistair and Wendy are going to share the findings of their research completed earlier this year into the impact of COVID-19 on the construction sector. Their research was commissioned by a group of construction companies who believe there have been positive impacts such as enhanced productivity, improved health and safety, um, and these were all as an unanticipated side effect of making sites COVID secure. So Dr. Wendy Jones is an independent OSH researcher working mainly within the construction sector. Um, and Alistair is Professor of Construction Management, sorry, Construction Engineering Management at Loughborough University's School of en Architecture, Building and Civil Engineering. It's a bit of a mouthful, Alistair. <laughs> so, um, so if I can hand over to the two of you, I don't know who's kicking off, so please take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm kicking off and presumably someone will let me know if they can't, can't hear or can't see. Um, I can see, uh, so you're okay. You can see, and yes. hopefully everyone can see uh, see the slides as well. So, so yes, thank you, uh, Jenny, for for that introduction. Um, uh, and it, you know, this is a really interesting uh, subject for us. We were approached, as was said, uh, by uh, the companies. They're they're there at the sort of bottom right of the screen uh, here to do this this piece of work, and it really did come out of um, a discussion that the um, the corporate health, safety and well-being uh, individuals that, for those companies were, were getting together to discuss uh, COVID challenges, amongst other things, to do with health, safety and well-being. Um, and, and they approached us saying, look, you know, we think something's going on, um, but we're not sure. And we recognise there's a benefit of having uh, some people from outside coming in and asking some questions and, and, and scratching around to see uh, what can be found. And, and hence... Um, uh, we did this piece of work and, and acknowledged to our colleague uh, Vivian Chow uh, was part of the of the team that did that. Uh, Wendy did uh, the field work and um, uh, wrote most of the report and Vivian and I were were part of the the team that she bounced things off and um, along with indeed the uh, representatives from the companies and we had a number of uh, interactions with them as well. Um, if you are interested, then the report is available. It was actually published by Balfour Beatty. Thank you very much for, for, for that. Um, and uh, therefore, it's available on the, on the web link that's on there. But also, if you go into Google or any other uh, search engine uh, and put COVID construction Loughborough uh, or words to that effect, then you will um, almost certainly uh, come across this report. So it's free to download. So please do that. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you will then see um, some of the things and be able to read them at your leisure. Um, one, one thing that's really important to say uh, right at the beginning is it, this is a snapshot. It, it was, uh, I suppose, the phrase that was used often in the discussions was quick and dirty. It was a, a piece of work which um, was needed to be done quickly because of what was wanted was a, an understanding of what was happening now, not, not looking back over things after a considerable amount of time. And quite often we do research where we are brought in at the end of something and you're speaking to people about what, what happened a year ago, what happened 18 months ago. And we all tend to intentionally or unintentionally uh, look back on things with a, a, a perspective that isn't necessarily totally accurate. So this was, this was um, quick and dirty, but done as close as possible at least to, uh, to when these things were, were impl implemented and, and that's, that's part of it. So, um, Wendy, do you just want to explain a little bit more uh, about this work? Okay, so, in, in terms of the practicalities of what actually happened, mm -hmm. we identified six projects on, on these particular company sites, and they were very much about identifying projects that were going to be interesting to look at and ones that we could get access to. Mm -hmm. So, there were, they were mixed of, of public and private projects. They were all quite large projects three in London and then one in the Northeast, one in the Northwest and one in the Midlands. And the people we spoke to, and they were mostly phone interviews and a couple of video, were a mixture from the, the main company and then some from their supply chain. And I was talking to project directors, site managers, supervisors, um, health and safety professionals. So it's a good mix of people. What we weren't able to do was talk to the front line because it was just too difficult with the time constraints and and with COVID, so it's it's very much managers and upwards, but there were people who were working closely with the, the 
the workforce. So they had a view of what their experiences were. And then in terms of the timings of, of when we did this and how this, how this worked, we did the research mostly in July. So lockdown started on the 23rd of March and some of the sites that we went to, they'd never closed down, they stayed open throughout. So they just adapted as they were going. Some of the sites closed down for one, two, almost three months in some cases. So a bit of variety there. And some of the sites were really well organized. They planned a long way in advance for this. They, they really got their ducks in a row. In terms of guidance from the industry, the first guidance came out on the 24th of March from the Construction Industry Council, and that's been updated on an ongoing basis since then. So that's, that has been really useful. But early on, that wasn't available for the sites that were planning, and they were very much having to just work it out for themselves. And one of the quotes I got was that this is the first time in my career that I didn't have all the answers. So they were very much having to work out for themselves what were the best things to do. The other thing about the timing is that the interviews were just at the beginning of July, which was just as the pubs reopened and the shops reopened and things were very much, there was a bit of a feeling things were going back to normal. And that was already starting to make things difficult. The, the workforce was starting to feel that this is all over now, it's all okay. So there was a feeling that that was going to make it progressively more and more difficult to implement the rules. Um, whether that did or not, I don't know. Obviously, we finished it in July. The other thing is a lot of people were just coming back to work after being on furlough, especially a lot of subcontractors. So they'd had a, quite a period out of work and were just coming back. The other thing about this timeline is obviously it stopped in October because that's when I first put this slide together. We're now five months on from when we gathered the data and we've had another lockdown since then. There's been a lot of water under the bridge. So this is the, the view of what was happening back in July and you'll have your own experiences of what's happened since then and, and how it's developed. And we'll think a bit more about that at the end of the presentation as well. So in terms of the, the changes that have been put in on site, I think this is probably fairly standard. You'll recognize this from sites you've been on and from most other industries that it was about one-way systems, about making more wider walkways, there's sticky tape everywhere you go. So that's all fairly standard stuff. Um, and then the other things that, that were happening were about basically just spreading people out. So just making sure people were distanced. So not rocket science, just putting bigger gaps in. But on top of that, and I guess it's partly the nature of construction, there was some really massive adaptations made on some of the sites. So for example, one site had built an extra staircase and one had built an extra perimeter walkway so that they could manage one way routes around the site. Um, some had rewritten three, 400 risk assessments. So there was some really quite impressive uh, work that went on to help sites adjust and to be able to keep working safely. And the impression that they all got was that the workforce really valued it. They were nervous about coming back and they appreciated what they'd done and they felt quite safe coming back. So there's, there's some big positives there. Um, I think it's also worth saying that that was the experience on the six sites we worked at. And they were sites from companies that take health and safety seriously and that really wanted to do things right. But that's not the experience that people had everywhere. And this is from back in March when lockdown first happened, that there was a lot of bad press that people weren't on safe sites and that the risks weren't being managed. So if your experiences are different from the ones we're reporting, that, that's understandable. Okay, Alistair. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, so again, if you've had a look at the report, this will be familiar to you. If, if not, then um, do, do do that afterwards. We were trying to pull together the, the various observations and, and, uh, and insights that we were finding. <clears throat> and what we ended up was producing this, this sort of diagram to help uh, structure the report, really. And hence, um, up at the top, it says trigger. Clearly, the trigger was COVID-19. And then there were some initial impacts, some things that, um, uh, that, that, that we could see. You know, you could actually um, see these people say, yes, there are fewer workers. Yes, there is improved planning and so forth. We could see those. Uh, we had information about them and so forth. Um, 
But then those impacts themselves led to some outcomes. Now, the outcomes in some cases were expected, in some cases were a surprise, um, but you know they were nevertheless what, what happened as a result of the impacts that, that uh, the interventions had caused. And then over to the right-hand side of this diagram are what we're calling results. Now, it's a bit of an unusual term, certainly for academics to use, um, because I, I, they should probably say, uh, say uh, potential results rather than results. So the things, and particularly the things in the dashed boxes that you can see there uh, on the diagram, the dashed boxes are things that, that we think there's some indication that they might be happening. Um, but clearly within the time scale we had, we couldn't measure those. And in, in fact, some of them potentially uh, would be very difficult whilst you might measure reduced incidence in ill health, whether you would be able to demonstrate causality um, between those reduced incidents and ill health um, to these other things is a, a completely different argument altogether. But nevertheless, there are things that we felt um, were certainly worth, worth flagging up. Um, another thing in the report there, bottom left of this slide, um, we, we're focusing today really mainly on, on, on these things uh, that we're looking at and in particular on improved housekeeping and increased frontline worker effectiveness, which we'll explain a little bit more about uh, in a minute. But in the report as well, there is a, more of a discussion on supply chain, on supervisors or black hats, on induction, on welfare and on hygiene. So that's just to, to, to uh, give you a little bit more on those in, uh, in your own time. So starting off with the, with the trigger and the main immediate impact. So the trigger is COVID-19. The biggest thing to be honest, and this was probably true for us in the early days at least, before wearing face coverings really kicked in, in those early days, it was about social distancing and, and people were planning social distancing. And that was the focus. Um, so that was the, uh, the, the main uh, immediate impact. But away from them then, that meant you had to have fewer workers because if you were going to have people um, distanced from each other, then you couldn't have as many people. But it also meant you had to replan, and Wendy will explain more about that uh, shortly. You had to replan and, and you had to arrange to have fewer workers working in the same area. And that also involved redesigning the site to some extent, as Wendy's mentioned, uh, in some cases with some fairly significant alterations to the site layout. But also not just the site layout, it's that it's actually the way things are done as well, less time waiting uh, to start work and so forth. Um, and the issue which Wendy again will comment on, the idea of better and more motivated workers. So they were the main site-based uh, impacts. Wendy, do you just want to expand on some of those, please? So in terms of improved planning, there was a couple of different ways that this came out. And one was that they'd really had to look at detailed risk assessments. So one, one quote, one of the senior managers said, usually it would be just carry on boys, whereas now it was that they really knew exactly what they were going to do and they planned it to a lot more detail. And that actually has some positive impacts, whereas normally they wouldn't think through to that extent. And the other way of planning was that they were often having to plan maybe six weeks ahead, eight weeks ahead, which they didn't always do. Now, neither of those things are particularly unusual. They're, they're standard good practice, but they were tended to be good practice that sites had slipped out of the habit of doing or some slipped out of the habit of doing. And they, by putting those back in because they had to, to deal with COVID, there were positive impacts that came out of that. In terms of um, having fewer workers, basically as Alice has said, that was just about having less people there so they weren't in each other's way. So they might have a group of two rather than a group of three. But also they had to sequence the workers. So instead of putting joiners, concrete workers, carpenters, electricians all in at the same time, it was very much planned that you go in, you do your work, you come out and then somebody else goes in and they do their work. And that's quite different from the way construction often works, which is just chucking everybody in and letting them fight their corner. So that, that was quite a change and people really felt that was a better way of working and they were generally quite a lot happier with that. There was a, an impact there on, on worker effectiveness because if you're under each other's feet, then it's much more difficult to get work done and there's usually somebody around waiting and you're waiting for somebody else to finish. Whereas everybody was just going to where they were meant to be, 
doing the work, moving on. So that just made things flow a lot more smoothly. If, you, if you've got a one-way system, you're two metres apart from people, you can't stand and chat because you're just too far away for that conversation. So that also makes things more effective. And also people were maybe having staggered starts. So instead of 50 people coming in at once and all standing around chatting, they had a five minute window to come in, go and get changed, go out to their site place. So again, that was smoother and then people weren't waiting around as much. And one of the sites reckoned that they'd got better and more motivated staff. So because they didn't need as many workers, there was, they were able to pick and choose who they'd got and to keep the good ones, to keep the ones who were prepared to follow the rules. So if anybody didn't follow the rules and didn't want to keep to the COVID distancing, they were asked to leave quite quickly. So they felt that had a positive impact as well. That's only one site, but on all the sites, I think there was a feeling that because people had come back, they'd been off work, they were very pleased to be back and pleased to be supported, that maybe that had a positive impact on how people felt to be there. So all of those things had a positive impact on housekeeping as a result of the planning, as a, as a result of, of having a better idea what they were doing when, not having to move things around as much. And the overall impression was that workers were doing more as a result. So each worker was able to achieve more. So some of that, clearly, if you've got a tidy site, then that's going to make you more effective. And I'll say a bit more about why things were tidier in a minute. Just to imp one of the other terms, and you might not be able to see this behind our pictures, I don't know how your screen looks, but the word productivity we've avoided using because productivity was influenced by lots of things like whether they could get materials, whether all the contractors they needed were even at work at the time. So we've looked at frontline worker effectiveness. So it's basically about whether each worker or each small group of workers was achieving more than they usually would be. So the improved housekeeping, and this was reported on five out of the six sites we looked at, was the, the feeling was that because people were working on their own, they weren't working with half a dozen other trades, that they took responsibility, they cleared up, they tidied up after they'd finished and then they moved out. And even if they didn't, if people made a mess, it was perfectly clear who made the mess, it was much more visible, so it was easy to enforce. So that, that all improved how tidy things were. And then there was a feeling that actually with a smaller group, you achieve more. So you might not achieve quite as much as you would do if you've got you know, a whole load of people but two certainly achieves more than half what you get with four people. Um, there, was, there was less having to move things around because the site was tidier. They didn't have to pick up piles of rebar, piles of equipment that were in one place, move them out of the way, put them somewhere else so that they could get clear access. They were, the planning meant that everything arrived just in time and it was just where they needed it to be. In terms of health and safety, it's very difficult to know whether that did improve. Statistics, it was too soon to see those. The overall feeling was that if you've got a tidier site, a more organized site, that should have a positive impact. And hopefully over time that will be confirmed, but it's, it's too early to tell. One last thing in terms of the worker effectiveness, just, just to flag a warning really, if workers are achieving more in their working day, potentially what they're missing is the standing around and having a bit of a rest and if you've got physically demanding jobs there could be a fatigue issue there so although it's good if you achieve more in the day we just need to make sure that that's not achieving more than is sustainable and that there aren't knock-on effects from that thank you Alistair okay so again just briefly in in passing really mention some of those additional impacts and and, and outcomes what I mentioned before really was this, the, the role of supervisors of, of black hats. And just really to flag up a couple of, uh, of other pieces of work uh, and other work that's been done uh, over recent years on this. So supervisors have been acknowledged as, as so significant in terms of worker health and safety and worker well-being. 
uh, and yet time and again they seem to be uh, the individuals who are left to be stretched in every direction and not necessarily trained or given the resources uh, that, that are necessary. So, yeah, you know, that certainly was a, a, an emphasis that, that, that came out. And again, we would um, uh, encourage uh, really further work on, uh, on supervisors <laughs> and how we can make their work more effective, um, not just for increased productivity as, as is often their, their target, but also uh, health, safety and well-being. And, and the other side as well was, was the, the supply chain and the relevance uh, of the supply chain in, in most construction projects, as, as most of you I'm sure probably know better than we do, um, you know, the supply chain, the supply network is very complex and, and all sorts of aspects are happening there. And this was in, indeed was the case with regards to uh, the, the sites that, that we looked at. Wendy. So I think the thing that's interesting is usually the power is very much with the main contractor and they choose the supply chain and they decide if they're happy with what the supply chain does. And here there was a bit of a switch the other way in that the supply chain was saying, we need to know it's safe before we're letting our, our teams come back. So the supply chain were actually sometimes going on to site to seek reassurance and to, to see the evidence that it was a good and well-managed site. So that puts a little bit of the power with the supply chain instead of the main contractors. And I think that's a bit of a shift. And supply chain also were having to take responsibility, having their own procedures, their own protocols for, for COVID risk, for how they were managing their own workforce. So again, that's, that's good practice and that's just pushing things a bit more to the way that, that we would really like them to be in, in construction. So if, if you're paying attention, you might see that this is a slide we've already used. We've got the same pictures here. But this is just to give you a bit more detail. The, one of the questions that we asked people was, what's changed and what would you like to keep when things go back to normal? And quite a few people said that they would like to keep the changes made to welfare and the changes made to hygiene. So the fact that toilets were cleaned more often, there were maybe better changing facilities, certainly a lot more cleaners one site have got 26 cleaners where they used to have four and changes in hygiene so that there were hand washing stations everywhere and it's really good that all those things were put in place but I do have a concern that if in construction people are saying gosh it's brilliant we were able to wash our hands on site that's not good and that suggests that a lot of sites are still operating below what you'd consider to be a good welfare standard and a good hygiene standard. So I think there's, there's some learning there. One of the other things that, that happened on sites was that they had to change how they did inductions. And all six sites had done something different to change their induction. So they might have had to do it, obviously they spaced people out. So they maybe had to do it with smaller groups so that they weren't taking as much space. They had to do it maybe online or they did it before they came to site. A lot of it got cascaded down to the supervisors. What was interesting is that every change they'd made to induction, they felt it was better. So whatever they were doing before, what they were doing now was better, even though they'd all done different things. And I think that says something really interesting about induction, that in construction, we're still not really clear what's the best way to induct people, what's the most effective, the most efficient, what should we be doing? So I think that, that again highlights something that we need to know a lot more about in the construction sector. And it's also just to, to add in there as well, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing discussion amongst a number of people in the industry. You know, are we talking about an induction or are we talking about an orientation? And if it's an orientation for the site, it has a certain uh, rationale. If it's an induction to, to the site and a bit of an induction to the industry, then it's a, it's a different thing and generally speaking i'm not sure as an industry we really know what we're trying to do when it when it comes to that and this was this was as wendy says just highlighted uh, some of those issues okay so a bit of a change of direction everything we've talked about so far was about the the sites about frontline workforce about experience of working on the construction site doing the building this is about the staff who were working in offices who were having to, to move to be at home or, or elsewhere. So 
big changes and they were changes that happened really fast and loads of people were impressed that construction generally had, had maybe not managed to grasp these things before and people adjusted really quickly to home working to having video meetings people who hadn't been that tech savvy or that willing to do it just adjusted really quickly so that that was all really positive and there was a feeling there were fewer meetings than they usually were and that that was a good thing some managers were going out on site talking face to face with teams going and actually looking at where the work was going on rather than have a meeting in an office so that that was all really positive stuff but I think there's we've got to be a bit careful as to how this gets adopted in the in the longer term so again with remote working that's really positive if you don't have to drive a couple of hours to work each day um, and some managers were really impressed that they'd always always dismissed home working as being the same as sitting at home watching television and you know doing the crossword and now realize that actually people can be incredibly effective when they're working at home but there was also some feedback that some people's well-being was really struggling, that they weren't happy at home, they were very lonely, they're very isolated. It's quite difficult to manage somebody's workload when they're at home. They, they don't necessarily stop and start at fixed times. It can really bleed into the day so that you're not working from home, you're living at work, was, was what one of the interviewees said. So we, we need to be careful that that we don't just fall into, well, let's just have everybody working at home because it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot more efficient because actually there's, there's some big downsides from that. And it, it's having back-to-back -back remote meetings is really hard work. You don't get to walk around. You don't get to, you don't get to chat to people. You don't get the, the sort of the coffee and a biscuit and a bit of a of offline interaction. And that's a problem from a... Um, from a work point of view, because you don't get to pick up the gossip, you don't get to find out all the other things that are going on that nobody's thought to tell you. And you also don't get the social relationship. And you also, as a side issue, don't get the physical exercise. And that didn't come particularly out of the research, but it's something else that people are, are very much stuck in one place and that there's going to be potential health consequences from that. And, and so, Wendy, Wendy, as a, as a chartered ergonomist, you were going to say something about this picture, which is not oh, from our research, by the way, it's one of my It was, you're right. This is a picture of a friend of Alistair's and he said, oh, we'll put this picture up because it looks nice and it illustrates people working from home. And I just looked at it and said, yeah, that's just, that's just disgraceful. That's just a shocking way to work. Um, but actually it's a big, a big issue that loads of people, I know at the college I was doing some work at, people had suddenly started working from home and they were working on laptops and they were working on laptops all day, every day. Never thought to say, actually, I need a separate keyboard, I need a mouse, I need a screen. And even if you've got all the kit, if there's four of you working around one kitchen table, you're never going to have good working arrangements. So as well as all the emotional and, and um, work-based issues that can arise with the remote working, there's some very practical ones that not everybody has got a sort of a, a nicely set up office that they can work in. So... Those of us who are fortunate enough to have had children who've left home have come out of it rather better than those who are still having to, to work around the rest of the family. So remote working, Zoom meetings, fantastic, and they definitely have their place in the long term. But we just need to make sure that we keep that proportionate and that it doesn't get assumed that it's definitely the way forward. And I think, I think the, other, the other thing that came out a little bit from the research, but has also come out from other interac interactions that I've had, uh, since we did this report has been that you know again we've got to remember who who ended up working from home who is still working from home says he sat looking out of his window on the rain on the garden um I'm not by the way in Loughborough University with a sunrise or sunset or whatever it is behind me um and and, and you know there was some suggestion there well yeah but the workers on one sense on, on one hand rather were saying hey it's quite nice just to be left on our own and and get on with things without all these senior bods walking around in their fancy high vis. On the other hand, um, certainly other work we've done recently, which emphasizes the importance of leadership and senior management engagement and so forth with projects, 
they were the people that weren't going to the projects because on in in many cases and this isn't specific to these six sites necessarily but it's a general statement in many cases the senior management were not allowed by their employer to leave their family home and therefore there was a reduction in uh, engagement of senior management on site now the workers, as I say, may well have, have, have liked that in some senses, but I think we need to ask ourselves the question, if that type of leadership and, and, and senior management engagement really is important, we take that away, you know, what's likely to happen? If it had any effect in the first place, then we take it away and um, we have to ask ourselves the question as to what's happening um, if we're removing that influence on the way things are done. So again, that's another thing moving forwards you know, is that something that's going to drop off because in the longer term, more of us are going to be more working at home because it's more efficient for us as, as senior people, but whether it's necessarily the best thing for the site is an interesting, an interesting point. I, th I think there's a, a couple of things that did come out of the data that relate to that, actually. And one is that some of the people, when we asked about health and safety, was it better, was it worse? They felt that there may have been a deterioration because of the lack of that leadership and a, a feeling that it was a bit like Sunday. It was a bit like sort of a bit downtime because the people who at that level weren't around. So I think that's important. And the other is the potential for, um, for people on site to not feel supported. And there were a couple of cases of that, that the feeling that people were sitting in their, in their ivory towers or bedrooms giving instruction without fully understanding the impact of, of what they were saying. And on one of the sites, they actually referred to the bedroom brigade as those people who were working from home. So again, a bit of a nod on them as those people who got themselves out there were doing the work on site and were putting themselves at risk of COVID, feeling a bit abandoned by the people who were in offices. And that, that wasn't universal by any chance, but it, it, there were odd cases of that. So I think, I think that is something that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so we've said that this was all done back in, in July. There was, we only looked at six sites. That's clearly tiny in the greater scheme of things. I did have one company contact me after we published the report to say that they'd done very similar investigation on their sites on quite a few of their projects and had similar feelings, similar findings. So I'm hoping that there are other organisations that have had similar results to what we saw and that it's not. It's not just one off that there is a pattern that there's the positive benefits that can come out of the way the changes that have been made. And then the other thing is to think about in terms of timing. And it's it, things have been going on a really long time now. We're five months since we gathered the data. We've had the second lockdown. And that's that's really got implications for workforce fatigue, for everybody being a bit sick and tired of following the rules of working different ways. So I don't know what things are like out on site now, but potentially it could be, be quite challenging. The other thing is that back when we did the interviews, the managers, some of them were really struggling. They'd had such a hard time having to just work full on to make changes, to get things in place so that it everything went to plan. They were really worn out and if that's carried on at that level then we really need to look out for those people over the next few months because they're going to be they're going to be struggling they're going to be really a, a burnout one of the questions they asked was what would you like to keep when things are over what's been good about this <laughs> one of the managers said it's all pretty shit really don't want to keep any of it so i think we need those who've got management responsibility and senior responsibility in construction need to be really looking out for their, their teams because there is an awful lot of, of fatigue and stress, I think, that's likely as a result of what's been going on. Okay, so um, just again, coming towards the end now, you'll be pleased. So uh, hopefully you have some questions, you're thinking about some questions for us. Um, uh, those, those results that we had um, on the right-hand side of the diagram, reduced incidents and ill health, Reduce costs, improve quality and longer programmes. And, and that is a challenge. So, so Wendy talked about worker effectiveness and gang effectiveness. Uh, but of course, most of the projects slowed down because they had fewer workers and they had fewer materials and so forth. So the overall project may have been slower, but, but 
but were the costs reduced? Well, could that be something in the future? Um, uh, longer programs, is that always a bad thing? Again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Improved quality, you know, is there evidence therefore that because people are not working over each other and tripping over each other and being hassled because the next trade is, is knocking at the door, are they working better? Are they working to a higher quality? And, and I think there are some opportunities that, that, that this sort of review gives the industry to just take a step back and, and consider uh, the, those aspects. Um, and, and really, though, we're talking here about, you know, are there long term results, projected long term results? And are these long term results which are beneficial and desirable? And if so, what do we need to do? What bits do we need to keep of the new things we've been doing uh, rather than just just drifting back? Um, this is a quote that, um, that Wendy had from the field work here is you wouldn't get the job because you wouldn't get the job. In other words, you wouldn't get the tender. You wouldn't win the tender because you'd be two or three months out. And, and then you're pushing water up the hill and the industry will revert back to where we were before is one of the realistic, perhaps pessimistic, but realistic uh, um, attitudes of a tier two uh, a contractor, I believe, in that, in that case. So just going back to this to this diagram again, that, that was really what we found. Um, uh, you know, it was a snapshot. It was time limited and it was at a time, as we said. And if we went and did the same study again now, we would find some things that would that were different. And that's important. You know, as researchers, we've been doing this for many years. And, uh, you know, it annoys me intensely that people uh, can make broad sweeping statements based on on specific interventions and specific observations. Um, and we're conscious of that, but really we're, we're trying to put this forward to you uh, and to others in the industry and, in, and influences in the industry to say, well, hey, you know, what, what should this make us want to look at further? What should this make us want to try out? What questions should this ask uh, of us uh, in, in that end? And again, don't forget the other things that we mentioned, the, the supervisors, supply chain, induction, welfare, and, and hygiene. So some take homes as we as we come to the end. Um, maybe it's a bit late for this already. How can you stop the drift back to old normal? Some of you may have a view that we've already drifted back. Some of you may have a view that with the vaccines coming along that, that people are saying, hey, it doesn't matter anymore because uh, the vaccine, you know, next week, week after, whenever it might be. This idea of worker effectiveness, how can we exploit improved worker effectiveness, which we believe there is a real, uh, real thing there that it is happening, but how can we exploit that such that the project outcomes are better? The one I've, I've um, emphasized there in yellow and bold is, are you willing to build slower, but better? Slower, but better. I, I started in the industry uh, about 40 years ago and, um, you know, we, we build a lot quicker now. And OK, is that a good thing? Well, yeah, but we also overrun a lot more and we and we don't manage expectations very well. And I don't think that the quality is necessarily as good as we'd like to think it is, despite total quality management and all the other quality assurance things that came in in, in recent decades. So, you know, maybe it's a, it's time to take a rain check and ask ourselves those questions. Are there better ways of building? And if one of those might be to take more time and more care, not only of the of our people, but also of the end product, then maybe that's a benefit. But then this other one as well, can we really demonstrate improved safety and health from changed practices? We said there's an indication that might be the case. There's lots of other aspects there and, and questions people are asking. But if that's something we want to know, then some more work needs to be done in that area. Um, we, we first used these slides a month or so ago, I suppose, six weeks ago, and we said the clock is ticking. And when I was chatting to Wendy earlier on today, I said, well, the clock has tocked. Um, you know, we are significantly further on and we're looking, uh, thankfully, that we're moving out of this, uh, this phase of, of COVID. Um, but, you know, is, is there still opportunity to learn, uh, learn lessons? That's the question. So, this is my last slide. Again, thank you for listening to us. Uh, again, if you want to get the report, then uh, follow that particular URL or alternatively go on to your chosen uh, web browser and put in COVID construction Loughborough and you should get to the report.
Um, happy to take any questions, Jenny. Um, Perfect. Over to you. Thank you very much. That's really useful. So we've got um, we've got a handful of questions on the Q and A screen. So if anybody else has any questions, please do pop them on the Q and A box on your screen. Um, I was just going to kick off with um, with one from me though, if I may. So. There's an, a lot of lot of interesting information there, isn't there? And I think you're absolutely right about uh, the clock ticking and people's attitudes sort of shifting and changing uh, in the period since you've done the research. But from your perspective, is there one major benefit to all of the changed working procedures that you think the industry should be taking forward? Um, I'll I'll have a go, and then Wendy can perhaps add add uh, add her view as well. For, for for me, I think it's that it's it's the opportunity to exploit the the individual and gang benefits, which I believe are are clear, and it's the opportunity to exploit those across the project. But we will not do that unless we change the way we do things, and unless we and I'm talking perhaps to the contractors. Um, uh, in the audience unless we stand up and agree I'm not talking about a cartel here but agree hey you know last year we built that particular project it took 24 months can we really say we can do it as well at, at 22 months and then next year it'll be 20 months because that's what's been happening and I think I, I think we ought to be asking some serious questions about about that Wendy yeah, and I think that's probably the main thing that I would I would say as well. On top of that, there's been there have been moves in technology. So obviously, I said that the Zoom meetings they're not the answer to everything, but they are definitely a good way forward in some cases if they're used in in the right way. And I think there was examples we had of, of for example, somebody doing a guided tour of two hundred people to his site to show them the changes he put in place. And so I think there's some really useful stuff there about and being able to demonstrate materials, being able to have discussions with very senior managers or with experts without them coming to site. So I think the willingness to take that technology on board in the right circumstances is also something that could be used as long as, long as it is targeted. I think there's, there's some benefits there. Yeah. And, and, and on, a, on a technological aspect, we, we've done some work previously uh, on the Tideway project in London, and they were using virtual reality um, in their tunnel boring machines such that you could actually have a virtual visit because they were trying to re re reduce the number of people who went down the tunnel just to have a look. Um, and, and that the VR was fantastic. So, you know, again, those technologies are there and, and, and perhaps this will, this will give us a bit more of a push uh, in certain areas. Okay, lovely. So, actually, actually sorry, oh, if I could on. just... Just on top of that, say, the other thing that I was really impressed with was where there was more face-to-face -face stuff going on because of this. So where managers were going out on site and actually talking to, to workers and, and knew their names and were, were much more embedded in what was happening at, at the absolute front line. So I think that's also probably an old-fashioned lesson that, that has been learned in some cases that's, that's worth carrying forward. Sure. So if I just move over to the Q&A panel... Um, so the first question that came through, thank you, Paul, for your question, who says this study was conducted with mainly tier one contractors. Do you think there is a difference um, for small or medium sized contractors? Um, he specifically is saying with, with around um, less preliminary allowances on projects. Do you think there's yeah. a difference? I, I, I think I think there always is. Again, we've done work in the past where we've looked at large networked organisations and then at small, medium sized and particularly micro uh, organisations. And and clearly um, <laughs> the problem in some ways with 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 the definition SME, small, medium sized contractors, is that some some medium sized contractors are actually very large uh, and, and micros are very small. So I think I think it, it, you can't make broad sweeping statements saying that, that this would be identical for, for the whole of that spectrum. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and cer certainly for those that are working on larger projects, as a number of, of, of those organizations are, then, uh, you know, if the industry moves, then, you know, we do hope there will be a trickle down. Um, it, it will be harder in some senses, I would suggest, for the smaller organizations to to implement some of these things. On the other hand, you know, there, there's an aspect there, there, um, their clientele are different. 
And, you know, is it, is it actually, would it actually be better if we honestly told Grandma Brown that it was going to take nine months to build uh, that little extension rather than saying it's nine weeks and still taking nine months? So I think as an industry, we, we do have a very bad reputation at, at making promises that we cannot keep with regards to duration. And, and I don't think that does us any service. I think in the, you know, amongst lay people, it does us a great disservice. So, you know, there's maybe opportunities there, but Paul, it's a, it's a good point. And I, I, we would not want to just say, yeah, hey, this applies right across the board. One of the organizations we were dealing with was not a tier one contractor. However, the sites, Wendy, I think it's fair to say were all large sites, weren't they? They were all large sites. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, slightly similarly, Andrew Richards has asked whether any sector was more affected than others. Or I don't know. I can't remember. I, I, I confess no, I didn't I, note which sites you went to. So yeah, yeah. I think the biggest the biggest challenges were about site size and right. site location. So the, the sites that were in London, I think, really struggled because they just didn't have the space. They were already very, very compact. Um, they had problems like having to get 100 people up to the top floor of a multi-story in five minutes and the queues of people going in the lift was right down the street. So I think, I think that was quite sector specific, whereas the, the ones that were building big open plan buildings just had a lot more flexibility and they could move briefings to different yeah. places. One yeah. site was able to put a new toilet block inside a building that was half completed just to give them extra facilities. So I think that's probably the biggest difference mm. in terms of actually planning the work. Again, if they were in a tight space, then, yeah, they were even more constrained in having have fewer people that they could actually fit yeah. in at once. So it would have made the job even longer. I think I think London was different as well, certainly in the early days because of, of public transport. So mm. well, not, not only that, but but also uh, the the uh, London mayor uh, putting um, increasing the congestion charge and increase uh, and including it weekends and so forth. So, um, you know, expecting people not to use public transport in a city like London is 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 not easy. And in fact, Wendy, if I recall, some of the, uh, the the sites we were working on, some of the people we were talking to, had said that workers felt more safe on their site than they did getting to the site because of the public transport challenge. So. Um, yeah, there's a difference there. In terms of sectors per se, then I think I think Wendy's hit it. In terms, it, it's probably more to do with size of site and size of, of, of availability of space on the site is probably more of the issue that we came across. Okay, lovely. So David Evans has asked whether you've since had any feedback that your report may be changing behaviours or methods of working. I think, I think it was, I, I, the methods of working would, would be, I would say certainly the replanning that was done at a task level certainly affected the methods of working. And we came across, it's not really in the report here, but as part of our study for the report, we came across a number of, uh, of suppliers, for instance, there one particular one comes to mind uh, where they'd done some videos showing how uh, some very large industrial doors could be installed whilst maintaining two meter spacing. And, you know, clearly, you know, people were saying, hang on, you know, we can do this because if, if this person stands this side and that person stands that side, then, you know, the doors in between them and then if they do this and that and so forth. So th there were clearly some opportunities. And, and I do think that there's a, uh, an indication that a number of those activities were re reorganized and were better afterwards because of the go back to first principles and replan how we can do this rather than just, hey, we've always done it like this, let's carry on. So I think that's the case. The danger, and Wendy's made this point very good, that, uh, very well. The danger is we just slip back into what we've always done rather than saying, hey, where's the two meters, you know? Uh, and so forth. So quite a lot of work done uh, uh, that, that I've seen. Behaviours, it, it wasn't something because we were not on site and we were not observing, we were not looking at behaviours. So that's something I think it would be inappropriate for us to, to really comment on. I'd like to think it did for a while. Whether it has done long term, I'm not so sure. 
it's tricky isn't it I mean my, my personal view is I think human nature has a very short memory and I can see us going back to pre-covid very quickly as soon as um, yeah. as soon as the miracle vaccine appears yeah but um, there you or, go or before or before yes yes so George Blumberg who's from Oxford Brooks has asked um, he says well first of all he says thank you for an excellent presentation that's very kind of you George um, he says he's, lo- he's enjoyed it and learned a great deal. However, he has got a question. Um, he's asked whether you could talk further about how you measured employee effectiveness and whether you think there are any advances in this area. <laughs> I, I think we have to say we didn't measure anything and that was intentional. Right back at the beginning when we were looking at the scope of the study and how to do it, we agreed that there was no point measuring anything because it, it was never going to be accurate enough. And once you put numbers on it, people assume that they're accurate and that they're true and that they can apply everywhere. So what we relied on was the impressions of the people on sites and what they said about what they'd seen. So, but having said that on each site, the, pretty much everybody we spoke to would say very similar things. So, so that's where the data came from. So it was triangulated, but it was all about their impressions and what they, they felt they'd seen. So it might be about, um, whether they'd, they'd made time upon the programme that they'd expected to lose, or it may be that a particular deadline that actually got ahead of themselves. But, um, but it, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't realistic to measure it. And the same with the health and safety. There were perceptions of changed health and safety, but it was, it was too early for the statistics to show. Um, to show okay. Um, last couple of questions then. So Paul Hardy has asked, one of the initial charts showed um, reduced costs. Um, yes. His concern is whether that would actually be increased costs, such as um, elongation of programmes and expand, yeah. you know, thickening of prelims. Um, in the long term, do we think clients are willing to pay for the additional costs? I think that's an excellent question, uh, really, Paul. Thank you. Um, uh, or, or not thank you. Um, uh, you're right. I mean... If, if we if we run with the status quo and just say it's going to be longer, then yes, it, it, of course it will. But it's a similar argument to to the argument, say, at pros and cons for offsite construction. Okay, so so people say offsite construction is brilliant. Okay, but but hang on a second, the factory supplier is charging us more money than our our onsite people can build that wall because hey, labour costs are low and factory costs stayed the same. But nobody looks at the prelims and says, what is the saving in prelims of reducing a workforce from 300 to 80? There is a saving in prelims, but all we do is say, well, it's the prelims of the prelims. So I think there will be increased costs unless and until the industry as a whole relooks at how we lump these things together. And I think prelims is probably one of the worst uh, uh, areas in this. Um, uh, we look at them more sensibly and more intelligently and sit down with the client and say, look, if we do it like this, if we do it like this, yes, it will take longer and these costs will go up, but actually we'll save costs over here because of this. We can actually in the long run have smaller canteens have because we've got less people on site at any one time, for instance, or whatever it might be. Um, it's not straightforward, I agree, but but the the, the comment, and it was a dotted a dotted line around reduced cost, it was a potential opportunity. And the reduced cost would only come if there was a reconsideration of the tasks, if there was less rework because the quality was better because people were working more efficiently and effectively and were not working over one another. And that's where the reduced costs might come from. But you're dead right, Paul, um, clients, unless we can in, you know, take intelligent clients and speak to them intelligently, we're never going to win that argument. So, you know, um, more power to your elbow, Paul, if you'd like to uh, like to try that. Happy to chat offline if you want. OK, and the last question, and then we'll draw it to a close. So David Evans has asked, over the period of your study, did you ask or find out whether there was any increased emphasis on record keeping? In other words, were people anticipating and preparing for claims or contract disputes? Um, and if I can pick that up, no, there was certainly no evidence that just never really came up that people were worried that there were, there were concerns about relationships with the client, about who was going to pay for the, for the change deadlines and for the fact things were taking longer and they weren't meeting things. Um, but other than that, no. 
And certainly there was one comment that somebody said they used to have meetings in an office. Now they were having them out on site. There weren't any minutes and it was absolutely fine. Everything was still getting done. So if anything, I think there was possibly less focus on ticking boxes and on record keeping and more focus on doing what they needed to do to get the job done. I think, I, th I think just what I add addition as well, bear in mind this was July and in July and certainly people were reflecting over the previous few months. I think there was a lot of goodwill at that stage and there was a lot of, hey, this is a major issue that we need to solve, but it won't last very long anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So I think the sad reality might be that, that maybe if we went back and did the same thing again, we might find more people looking over their shoulder and trying to at least justify that their actions that they took were um, adequate and, and, and sufficient given that situation. So the perception in July, I think, was that this was going to be a much shorter thing. And, and therefore, hey, you know, let's get on and solve the problem and we'll do that in a in a joined up way. So. So, yeah, it's a it's it's a good, good question or good comment, David, certainly. Sure. OK, lovely. So that draws a Q&A to a close. I've just want to thank Alistair and Wendy for an excellent presentation. I'm, I'm going to hope that you're continuing your research so you'll be able to uh, to keep us up to date. But I don't know what your plans are really for continuing. <laughs> We, we, will, we will do whatever whatever people want us to do in a sense. If, if this has whetted anyone's appetite to say, hey, let's have a look at that. Let's let's measure some of this stuff. Then whether it's us doing it from, from our perspective or whether we would bring in people who, who have different expertise in terms of work study and so forth, then, hey, you know, speak to us. Let us know. OK, lovely. Um, and just a very quick little bit of housekeeping. So upcoming events. I know we're drawing closer to Christmas. Um, for the Cambridge, or Cambridge Corridor Club, we have got online networking breakfast on the 8th of December next week, followed by our AGM. There is also a, a further webinar on the 9th of December, um, which is AstraZeneca, who are based in Cambridge. And then for Constructing Excellence Oxford, we have the festive uh, networking breakfast on the 18th of December. And Otherwise, there is nothing left for me to do now, but thank you all for attending. Thank our speakers again, and thanks to Stuart for doing all the tech, and we hope to see everybody again soon. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Thank you.